Alec Quorum. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, welcome everyone and good morning, good evening, good whatever. Um, uh, so we have a fairly light agenda. We've got an update on the, the Hackfest doodle poll that Todd had conducted that he'll review and um, give us uh, an idea about when and where we may be doing our October Hackfest. And then um, <clears throat> we've got a proposal from Babel um, to incubate uh, a new project. And um, we'll go through that. Um, we can decide whether or not we're ready to vote on approving it or people want to give it more time and thought and so forth, but um, we'll certainly <clears throat> have plenty of time for them to introduce the project and answer any questions that we may have. So, Todd, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so in terms of the next two Hackfests, we ran a doodle poll for the upcoming U.S. Hackfest. The most likely dates look like the week of September 4th or the week of September 11th. Uh, we'll certainly try to do this on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, just to make it easy for travel. As of right now, we have uh, a couple uh, venue options in Chicago. I think the initial request was for East Coast. Uh, so a couple questions. Uh, are there strong objections if we were to do this in Chicago? Uh, and then if so, um, if anyone has venue space at your companies uh, in the New York or even Boston areas, um, please get in touch with me on that. Uh, otherwise, we can look to move towards uh, a paid venue space if needed. So just quickly from, um, so from those on the, the fourth. Hi, sorry, the September 4th is Labor Day, right? Uh, I believe so. So we would certainly avoid that. Yeah. Uh, I think we were just okay. looking broadly speaking at, at at weeks at this point, as opposed to specific days. So from those on the call, is there any strong aversion if we were to hold something like this in Chicago, uh, or is the preference really to be very much on the East Coast? This is Dan. I was actually going to be looking into some space around Minneapolis, but I uh, got sidetracked on some other projects. No worries. So to the extent that Minneapolis and Chicago are different for people, that's that's another option here. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll poke around uh, with a few other contexts that we have to see what turns up in New York and circle back with... Uh, a few options just to get this locked down. We're still uh, about three months out, uh, but we'd like to get this done as soon as possible. And then the other component is we are looking to bring the final Hackfest of the year out back to Europe. Uh, we did this in Amsterdam last year in October, uh, trying to hone in on some dates there. Please take a moment to complete the doodle poll. Let us know your preference on dates. Uh, and again, we'll move through the funnel and uh, figure out a suitable time and location for this. Any questions? Otherwise, we can move on to the proposal for today. All right, uh, so Martin and Giacomo, I will make you presenter now if you have any slides you'd like to run through. Okay. Sure, thanks. It looks like I have to download an extension, so. Were you gonna present charts or do you just wanna walk through the proposal? So now we have a we have a small PowerPoint presentation. I know the the conversation has already started on the on the um, on the mailing list. So I don't know. Do you want to jump jump straight to to the discussion or or go through the PowerPoint presentation? Oh, no, no, we've got charts. That's fine. Uh, feel free. I mean, like I said, we have all <laughs> we have the full hour okay. here. Okay, well, that's good. That's great then. Uh, okay, so I'll just. Can you? The, the slides? Yep, we can see it. Yes, uh, yes we do. Okay, okay so, uh, yeah, first of all, thanks everyone for considering the, the proposal. Um, uh, well, let's just get straight into it then. So what the project, the name of the project we're, we're bringing here is, is Babel. So it's, uh, it's a distributed consensus uh, component. 
so I'll explain quickly what Babel is, uh, why we built it, and why we're applying to, to Hyperledger. Then I'll give a quick, uh, quick overview of how we built it and um, which projects we think we can integrate uh, with uh, that are part of, the, of Hyperledger. And finally, um, the status, so where we are in development and the resources that have been put into it uh, at this stage. Uh, okay, so what is Babel? Babel is basically it's just an ordering system. So it's it's kind of it's like a, back, a black box where you input transactions and it takes care of broadcasting it to other participants in a in a permission network, and uh, and then it feeds back the it outputs the transactions back in consensus order. So that means that all the participants that receive these transactions uh, can be sure that all the other participants are seeing the same transactions and receiving them in the same order. Um, so we're using the hash graph algorithm, uh, which is a uh, Byzantine fault tolerant in the sense that it you know, tolerates up to one third of uh, faulty nodes, including malicious behavior. And finally, it's um, it's a, it's a loosely coupled, it's a really modular solution in the sense that the interface between Babel and uh, the app is um, over, a TC, over TCP sockets. It's a simple, simple JSON RPC interface with uh, just a couple of endpoints. Uh, we'll see that later. And so the fact that it, the, it's abstracted by a TCP interface uh, makes it possible for the two components to run on separate, uh, in separate processes or separate machines. Uh, uh, yeah, so why why did we build it? So first of all, we're presenting this project um, as a company. Our company is called Mosaic Networks. We're based in London, and it's, uh, it was founded a, a few months ago. And um, so basically what we're seeing is that peer-to-peer -peer and peer-to-peer -peer systems and um, distributed computing in general is, is, gaining, is gaining traction. And we think that we're, we're going to be seeing more, let's say, mainstream apps running on top of distributed networks. So, I mean, distributed systems. And so, in this context, there's going to be a, a need for, for dynamic consistency or consensus algorithms. And so, our, our goal as a company is to, is to create uh, easy, easy to use plugins that provide these, cons these, these consensus uh, algorithms. Now, we also realize that the, 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 the technology is, is new and it's not very mature and for it to become mature, there's gonna be a need for, there's a need for specialization and standardization, just like it happened in, in, in other industries where companies focus on, on uh, a specific feature, let's say, of the technology and do it well, and then they all get together and define interfaces and standards to make sure that all the bits fit together. And Hyperledger seems to be at the, seems to be leading kind of this, this thing in this, and putting together projects and experts and um, trying to make them all work together and come up with standards and, and code that is ultimately um, ready for production use, and so so yeah, that's the, that's kind of the reason why we would like to to get into our, to Hyperledger. So our solution is here. We yeah we, we provide um, a scheme a simplified simplified version of the drawing that's presented in the in the in the document in the proposal. What we really want to uh, to show here is that is um, how the app and Babel work together. So what, what the interface is really, uh, as you can see, it's a very simple interface with two endpoints. The app sends transactions to Babel uh, via, an endpoint, via the submit transaction function and the Babels, and Babel sends back transaction to the app via another endpoint. And Babel takes care of sending the transactions to other participants and it runs the hash graph consensus algorithm to make to order these transactions. Um, so the, the the hash graph algorithm 
was published, I think, in, uh, last year in a white paper by Lehman Baird, so it, was invent it wasn't invented by us. And uh, as it's been raised, uh, it's been said in the in the emails that have been exchanged lately, it's, it hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but there are some some proofs in there that the system is Byzantine fault tolerant, up to one third of nodes, um, and it has another very interesting feature, which is uh, is fairness, which means that it's it's very hard for well, since it's not leader based, it's very it's very hard to um, manipulate which of two transactions get um, gets added first in the consensus order. So this is this is something that's important for certain uh, sp specific types of applications like uh, a stock exchange or a game, for instance, or uh, such things where it matters which of two transactions gets ad gets considered first. Um, I don't know, I can go later into more detail about the solution if uh, anyone is interested. Uh, otherwise, uh, what I can add, uh, yeah, there is, it, uh, it assumes for the moment that it's a, uh, a closed set of participants where we know upfront who the participants are. Um, but this, this is not a limitation of the hash graph algorithm. This is just for the moment uh, the way we've implemented it. And it's, it's possible to extend it to, to add or remove participants on the go. Uh, it's, it's also, uh, yeah, so the code is, is on GitHub and it's, it's written in Golang and uh, licensed under the Apache, Apache version 2 license. Uh, okay. So uh, we think how, how we're going to integrate with other Hyperledger projects. So there are two projects that we know that the interfaces are logically compatible. In fact, they, they match almost one to one. That's Fabric and Burrow. They were architected on purpose for modular consensus. And um, we've looked at we've been looking at the code for a while, and we know uh, there, there's it's they're compatible. There's a bit of work to do there, but they're compatible. Now, so tooth lake, uh, it wasn't obvious how the interfaces uh, would match, but uh, obviously we have no no um, problem with work, working on that project as well eventually. Mm. So yeah, these are these are the the three projects we we think we would integrate w well with at first. And then I think what's interesting is that in the process of doing this, we'll probably uh, find, find commonalities and things that, yeah, so are similar in, with all of these platforms, uh, Fabric Bar and so Tooth Lake, especially around configuration and, you know, the configuration files, the way you, you define what the validators are, who the validators are, and things like that. And it can be, it can be standardized. So, the process of actually trying out the same consensus plugin with 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 all of these three solutions will probably um, kind of start this process of finding uh, commonalities. I think and and do making a first step towards standardization, which, if I understand correctly, is 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 the goal of uh, of Hyperledger. Uh, yeah, and finally. Uh, I think Hyperledger also would benefit from having uh, in its portfolio a solution for for a consensus plugin, uh, you know, to choose from when the clients decide to set up uh, a DLT with either Fabric or Burrow. Well, they can they, one of the algorithms, the consensus algorithms they could choose uh, would be Babel. And so where are we at now? So yeah, as, again, as I said earlier, we're we're in London, where um, there's actually a vibrant community around the uh, blockchain, and especially it's, it's driven by banks, really, or the financial sector. And there's also so a lot of meetups, uh, really, really a lot of energy in the space. So we're now going to we're now hiring hiring people actively, and we want to to participate in you know in the open source community, and and part of that is also potentially joining uh, Hyperledger. So yeah, that's all we've got right now. So 
don't know, we're, we're open to questions and if, if there's anything, any of the slides you would like us to go into more detail, uh, please let us know. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions from the peanut gallery? I see a couple of thoughts on the getting the, the paper from human peer reviewed and so forth, but any questions for um, Martin? Yeah, hey, uh, um, this is Dan from the, the TSC. Uh, I appreciate your responsiveness on the email list. I think we we're able to work through a few things there. Uh, I do still see that there's a probably general interest in, in getting more clarity on the algorithm itself. And I think since the project is essentially the algorithm, uh, I think if we could spend some more time uh, during this meeting with you walking through the algorithm that might help some of us. I see Hart has okay. a specific question there too about the uh, the big O on the messages. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, thanks for the talk. So I had a quick question. So I was skimming through the white paper last night um, and when I looked at the message count, I got um, n log n. Can you guys tell me how you get uh, n? Well, um, for for a message to let's say for yeah, an event to get committed, there's there's this concept of a witness being strongly seen. So, in the best case. The best case scenario for a message to be strongly for a witness to be strongly seen by another participant if, is if the message goes through. Um, if I mean, if, yeah, if the the events go from one participant to the other in order. So from let's say there are four participants. So and the first participant uh, syncs up with the second participant. The second goes with the third, and the third syncs with the fourth sequentially and then the fourth back to the first then the first strongly sees uh, the the other the, the previous events you see what I mean or yeah so so my thought was kind of this was like the uh, the coupon collector problem so so correct me if I'm wrong here um, so kind of the the way hash graph works is right the first player in the first round, sends a, the transaction or message or whatever to the second player, right? And yeah. then in the second round, the first player and the second player send a message to a, to a random person, right? Uh, and well, it's kind of, not, yeah, okay, yeah, yes. Yeah, so. is, is that, so, so it kind of propagates like this, right? So after yes. like, um, you know, there's this like exponential growth in the propagation, right? Um, yes. So, so my thought was this was exactly like the coupon collector problem. Are you guys familiar with the coupon collector problem? Uh, no, I've never heard of it. So the coupon collector problem is the following, right? Um, so suppose like, I mean, I guess ma mathematicians in the olden times didn't lead very exciting lives. But uh, suppose that you're like, you know, getting a coupon in the newspaper every day. Yeah. Um, and there are, say, 10 coupons in a set, right? And you get a random coupon in the newspaper every day, right? How many yeah. kind of days does it take in the expectation to get a full set of coupons, right? And so here, basically, we want, we want everyone in the graph to, to see the transaction, right? Yeah. Since people are sending kind of people are sending transactions randomly, essentially, right? Some people are going to get duplicates, right? If there were no duplicates, it would be order n, right? But if there are duplicate, you know, the, the duplicates might mess things up. Yes, okay. um, and it turns mm -hmm. out that I believe this is isomorphic to this coupon collector problem, um, okay. which has which which takes kind of n log n um, and okay. not n. And so so I was curious about this. Um, does, yeah. does my analysis make sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, it makes sense. It's a good point. So I think when I said or when I was said uh, order of n, that's the best case scenario. And I think if I understand correctly, in the the, the problem you're describing, the n log n is kind of um, 
it's an average mathematical analysis. yeah it's in a mathematical expectation so it's it's probabilistic so uh, maybe you're right um, ultimately the average number or the ex the expected number of messages per round round uh, rounds that are defined in the hash graph algorithm maybe is n n log n I'm, uh, maybe you're right yes is so, the, so that's the messages right and the expected number of rounds should be log n log log n so again if you're just running this experimentally you're not going to see this at all okay. um, because obviously log log n is going to be like infinitesimally small for any kind of practical parameters okay um, but it it's probably worth going through the uh the mathematical analysis of this uh rigorously yeah, I, also had a, I also had a question about fairness um, so you guys in your proposal say the protocol offers fairness. So I like I skimmed through the white paper and the section on fairness is there are no proofs and it's kind of just like mostly things they can't achieve. Um, can you guys go into more detail on that and kind of present exactly what you mean by fairness and maybe like sketch out a, a proof or an argument of why you achieve that fairness? Okay. Uh, well, I can try to, to give you my understanding from what I've uh, understood from the white paper. So the problem of, uh, of fairness is to say, if two people submit, uh, they each submit a transaction, Alice and Bob submit, uh, submit transactions, and Alice submits her transactions before, her transaction before Bob's, then it would be fair if Alice's transaction came first in the consensus order. That's basically uh, how we can put the, 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 the fairness question. So if, if the ordering system is just one server, we would say the server is fair if it puts Alice's transaction before Bob's. Now, in a distributed system, it's, it's a bit different. It's, it's not just one server. So for instance, in, in a leader-based uh, a, a leader consensus algorithm, it's the leader, the person who is responsible for creating the next block, who has a say, or who has the power to decide which transactions get inserted in that block and in which order. So again, we would, we would, we would say that the validator and the, cons and the consensus algorithm in general is fair if the validator um, doesn't kind of manipulate that order. It doesn't choose and say, you know, okay, I don't like Bob. I'm not going to insert his transactions in the next block, or I'm going to I'm going to make it appear last, or things like this. Um, so again all these other these other algorithms the other algorithms so that are leader based or even proof of work or you know uh, proof of x kind of algorithms are kind of are vulnerable to this attack let's say can be unfair on the other hand um, the hash graph is is not leader based so basically what, what does it mean if the hash graph is fair? Again, if, if Alice submits her transaction first before, b before Bob, there's a chance that since it's a gossip algorithm, if she's connected to at least one, uh, one other node, then the transaction will, all she has to do is sync up with, with, with one other node and the transaction will spread through the network. And the event is already created, is already registered in the hash graph the minute she syncs up with one person. So all she has to do to get her transaction inserted in the hash graph is to have it, uh, is to sync once with one person. Um, so that's my understanding of, of, uh, of, of why the hash graph is fair. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I understand why the hash graph is fair if there's no adversarial behavior, right? I mean, but all of these things are fair if there's no adversarial behavior. So the interesting case is what happens if I have some kind of adversarial coalition? What if, say, Dan and I are um, 
you know, are together on some hash graph and we try to corrupt the system. Uh, what can we do? So, so that's mostly what I was interested in. And I probably should have specified that more clearly is kind of under what adversarial uh, network conditions are the, uh, is the, or, or what adversarial conditions um, is hash graph fair? And I guess, um, Okay, ab ab about the comments. Um, so, Stefan, um, I'm I'm not talking about uh, rounds. So you get a chance for each coupon, and kind of uh, every time a player decides to send a new message, so you obviously get many more chances to get a coupon than one um, in each round. Uh, um, yeah, but each each message includes. All the uh, all the coupons that the player that sends the message uh, already knows, right? So you know right, only but, one coupon code. Sure, um, but even kind of at the end of the um, even at the end of the protocol, that's only going to be like on the order of log n or log squared n, right? You're still going to not know most of the the messages, right? Um, They're still I'm, going I'm to sure mostly be unknown. That. So, um, so yeah, I mean, so I just skimmed the white paper, so it's, it's possible that, uh, that my analysis is incorrect, but I think this should be like definitely rigorously proven. Um, but yes, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right that for each node, it, it, it will still be O of N or less. Um, I think it will be much less actually. I think the bound will be like log N, log, log N. As I mentioned yeah, I before, think, I think I think uh, these kinds of analyzers just I don't know they they haven't been done I think or maybe they have but I don't know I don't have the background to you know formally prove stuff like that I wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah, so it's probably I mean, um, yeah. So regardless, I would highly recommend that, like, um, you guys try to talk to somebody who can who can help you formally prove a bunch of consensus stuff somebody like marco or christian or some like you know um so some well known someone who's you know a, a good consensus expert um because some of this stuff like proving fairness in the adversarial model is is really tough um so yeah i mean i mean i think as far as i understand it the um like you asked what what you what you could do if you wanted to prep the system and well you you need to get you know <laughs> more than a third of all participants on your side and you know form the plan to heavy corrupt the entire system like <laughs> if you can do that you you're able to corrupt it but otherwise so, i don't so, that, know. so that's for bft um and unfortunately like i'm not a, a bft expert like somebody like christian or marco um, so I, you know, I couldn't like quickly digest that proof. It would take me longer to go through and analyze. Uh, but the fairness, I think you can, I think there are attacks on fairness with a lot less than one third of the network. So do, I mean, kind of how I see this hash graph protocol is you're ostensibly trading uh, messages for finality time, right? So it, it takes transactions a lot longer to propagate than if you just kind of blast everything to the network in one step, but you get to send a lot less messages basically. Um, and yeah. kind of the, I, I think that's, that's kind of the point of the, the, the algorithm. Um, and the, uh, one of the drawbacks of this is it kind of gives a lot more rounds where people can mess with fairness. So kind of right in round two, like, right, if Alice is honest, her transaction will have only been seen by two people. So if Bob wants to blast a competing transaction, um, he can perhaps in the same round have his adversarial coalition only broadcast messages to each other. And that way in the next round, they can completely reforge their messages from the past round. Um, and and this, this seems like a pretty strong attack on fairness. Um, 
and and so you know the, the white paper doesn't offer really any proofs against fairness. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's it's kind of just just speculation. Um, so I was curious that this is why I was asking the question on fairness. I was curious if you guys had any kind of like supplemental argument uh, for mm -hmm. for adversarial fairness. No, no, we don't have any supplemental arguments actually, but. Um... But you're right. It's it's definitely questions that uh, that need to be researched more. And yeah. Um, but could you could you put your um, idea of an attack on the hash graph into text form? Um, we probably can be will be able to take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I can't do it now. I mean, but I can probably get to it later today um, if you want me to kind of write out what I had in mind and you can tell me whether it's right or it's wrong or, you know, or maybe it's addressed by some easy mitigation. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, um, but I think the long-term goal should be to have a proof because if there was a proof, then it, it would allow me to very quickly rule out or it would be either allow me to rule out my attack or say that kind of my attack is like accepted by the system. Mm, yeah. So, Sounds good. So I've been uh, trying to get, you know, Lehman also involved into this, like directly. Uh, he's super busy, but yeah. So if you can just write something together, uh, put it together, so like an idea of an attack, and I'll, I'll see. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll be happy to get to that sometime today. Hey guys, it's it's it, it's. Oh, big echo there. It's Richard, Richard Brown from, from R3. Um, hopefully this is a, an entirely complete trivial question, especially compared to um, to the grilling you just got from, from Hart. Um, oh, hang on a second. I know, I know. Hang on, I've just... Sorry, I know there's an echo because I'm logged in on two devices and I was speaking into the wrong one. So beginner's mistake. Um, so hopefully a really, really um, trivial question, which is you showed um, a simple diagram at the start of the deck where you had the application um, connecting, I think it was uh, from memory, I think uh, just, just a REST call to um, to the um, one of the implementations of the algorithm, which is then sort of connected over the network to the REST. I just wanted to understand the, the diagram wasn't entirely clear to me. Um, are you assuming the 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 the, the, the I guess the, the node to which you're connecting is a is a member of the cluster, um, or is it is it a proxy to the cluster? And in either actually, if you scroll if you scroll to the um, the there we go yeah so you've got this thing called the, um, the yeah the, the the from the picture it looks like that babble box is is a member of the consensus cluster, and if so. What are you assuming there? You're assuming that that thing is, is 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 acting on your behalf, and therefore you assume that one is not Byzantine and you trust it. Or you're assuming it could be, and you could connect to any at random, but they will then furnish some sort of proof back to your app um, that the Babel proxy will um, validate um, to convince you that you weren't just speaking to a, um, a Byzantine member. Uh, you no, know, so yeah, we're not making any assumptions about whether the the Babel node is uh, Byzantine or or not. It's uh, it's it's just a direct participant in the the consensus network. Okay, so I can connect to any in the network, and what what it sends back to me with that commit transaction blob call that presumably and if if this is a if this is just a really naive question, just to shout me down. But I, I might do I need to assume that message that comes back contains sufficient evidence for me to convince myself that the consensus process did indeed complete and ended with that conclusion. Yes, that's correct. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So uh, I have a question to this: uh, the the bubble part. It, um, this is this is also like self-hosted, right? Like it runs. Like like the question is: there's app proxy, right? So does this app proxy need to be you know application specific, or can I can you just use um the same the same bubble um find a building block for any system like do you need do you need to have specific, do you need to change or modify you know Babel in order to work with different kind of applications if you make a new application no you don't need to to modify Babel. the app proxy is generic it just exposes the the two endpoints it receives 
it receives submit transactions. It's basically a server. It receives uh, transactions and it sends transactions back. And it, it makes no assumptions as to what kind of application is standing on the other, on the other side. Uh, so is there already uh, some, some servers, maybe even publicly accessible running right now? Uh, no, no. But the, well, the thing is that the um, Babel, Babel node needs to to be started side by side with another app. If there's no app, in, if there's no app listening to it, it it's going to crash. So we can't just put uh, Babel nodes on the cloud and have any kind of app uh, connect to it. Do you, do you see what I mean? It has to be deployed side by side with an app with an application. Does that answer, answer your question? Or? For now, yeah. <laughs> this is Vipin. Uh, question is why? Why does it have to be deployed? If you are if you are having a um, standard interface and nobody is connected to you, why 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 does Babel crash? Uh, yeah, maybe it's it's just an implement the way we've implemented it at the, at this point. So the 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 way it's implemented now, um, I guess. I guess the idea is, was that first of all, you don't want to have uh, different apps running on the same uh, on the same Babel network. It, it doesn't really make sense for for two nodes to to run a different app. And, and use the same transactions. You see what I mean? Uh, now we could make it so that Babel doesn't break if there's no if it, there's no app listening on the other side. That's uh, I think that, that's totally feasible. Well, personally, personally, I think it would make perfect sense to have you know just one network but lots of apps connected to it. And if there's like a block coming in that an application has no clue what to do with it, yeah, it just ignores it, right? Yeah, I see. So it'd be kind of like a kind of like a, an Ethereum type of thing. But then, then there's issues with scalability. There's no reason for for an app to be connected or to be receiving transactions or to be sharing the same network as another app. I mean, it depends what you're trying to achieve, really. I suppose. Uh, I think if you're trying to do something, uh, whether if there's no reason to be on a shared network, then uh, there's no reason. But so, so here's here's my my vision I had what to do with the hash graph right like I I, I had this idea uh, like a year ago already and then I met Brian Bielendorf and I also uh, pitched this idea to him at the at the Linux at the Linux conference but I don't know but maybe the time is now you know like the idea was um, to have a a public accessible hash graph that does exactly this you know taking uh, Transactions from an application yeah. and building the consensus order, you know, based on the hash graph algorithm. And once it's done, sending uh, the commit transactions commands back to the application, you know, in the consensus order. And, you know, if stuff like this, like if assuming this would exist and is proven to be correct, it could completely replace uh, Bitcoin, you know. So it's basically yeah. offers the same benefits as Bitcoin or Ethereum, but completely without any mining involved. So no, no energy. You know, you know what I mean. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So it's a public network, but I'm not sure the hash graph is actually uh, suitable for such a for such a project because it doesn't actually scale to an immense number of of nodes. Um, other algorithms would be more suitable for that, like uh, well, actually maybe proof of elapsed time or um, Algorand. I think they scale a lot better and, and uh, yeah, so for, for, for these types of, of public networks, <clears throat> maybe Hashgraph is not the best solution. I think where it's, the, where it's better, where it performs better is in, in let's say, medium-sized networks, uh, you know, around 20 participants, uh, maybe more. It also depends what kind of latencies you're, you're looking at. But you're, you're, that's true. Sure. So the issue, the issue I was having when I was, you know, experimenting with um, scaling hash graph is just the question how to handle um, dynamic, dynamically joining nodes. But what, what's yeah. more difficult is how do you handle uh, 
dying notes, you know, like yeah. with a note, if a note dies, the the entire and we don't handle for this case the entire hash graph like won't be able to reach a consensus anymore. So it would completely crash if too many nodes are, are dying. Yeah, so that's, many... like, that's kind of the open question like that I'm trying to find a solution for. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. It's, uh, it's also a difficult question. Yeah, no, no more questions. <laughs> okay. Another angle, uh, well, in the community, is it only the Babel uh, that you know, Babel uh, members who are in the community, or are there others like, I guess, Stefan uh, or somebody else? Uh, how 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 wide is your community? Uh, sorry, I fail to understand. I don't understand the question. Suppose you take all the people who are developing on GitHub under this Babel. Is it? First of all, it's open source right now, or is it not? Yeah, it's open source, yeah. So who other than your members of your company are developing on this? Uh, no one else really at the moment. We just we just open source it and uh, yeah, we there's a, uh, I've, I've, I'm the only contributor for the moment, but that's also why you want to, to join Hyperledger. Okay, uh, because Normally, the um, the question asked by the Hyperledger community would be, uh, you know, is there already a vibrant interest in this? If it's just one person, then you know there there are going to be problems if you if you lose interest, for example, and that project will languish. Uh, the other thing is, how do you intend to drive uh, interest? In the project, which you have to always actively work towards. Uh, these are, you know, these are some of the uh, things that that uh, I think the TSC considers when they uh, when they incubate a project. Yeah, that makes uh, that makes total sense. Um, see, until now we've been we've been just uh, developing the prototype, so we haven't been pushing uh, this kind of aspect. But you know, as Stefan mentioned, there's the, 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 we've been getting interest though in in uh, in providing demos and explaining how it works, and there are people who are actually um, uh, downloading the code and using the code to to, to build demos with. Um, there's there's actually many among uh, here friends, developer friends in in London. Um, I think. Mo mo more importantly, we need to show uh, some some direct applications of the program and to show how how it's it's, it's easy to integrate with apps, and from there, um, the kind of momentum uh, will build. That's what we expect, and um, so integrating with with projects that are already doing a proof of concepts. Out there with the you know in, in real life deployments, that would be the first step, and um, uh, and yeah, I think there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a, a vibrant community here in, in London of people who are looking developers, a lot of developers who are looking to to get into this this blockchain sector, and so I'm convinced that it's it's, it's it wouldn't be hard to uh, to bring people into the project. So, you know, I I haven't weighed in on this, but mostly my thinking sort of falls with where Brian was coming down in the mailing list, and that is, um, you know, I can certainly appreciate the significance and importance of peer reviewing and having the protocol sort of validated as a sort of a gate for uh, adopting something in a business context where you would want to make sure that the risk is significantly mitigated, that it actually doesn't work um, uh, in some cases, and would then therefore be very disruptive to the to the business. But for purposes of incubating projects at Hyperledger, you know, um, I don't necessarily think that 
that that necessarily has to be a bar we have to leap over. Maybe for an active project, um, you know, we might want to hold up a higher bar, but for incubating things that are sort of at the experimental phase and where the, you know, the broader community is starting to get interest in, and may want to come in and help to build, I think that's fine. And I think if there's peer review that's ongoing that reviews that, that would be a good thing. Um, uh, and, you know, then we have an opportunity where Hyperledger participated in sort of bringing that innovation to the market. That's what this project is really supposed to be about. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, you know, from my perspective, there are really, you know, the criteria that we should be looking for, number one, there was some um, concerns raised about IP, and that certainly needs to be chased down. Um, if there's, you know, um, you know, if the uh, uh, if the hash graph is encumbered with um, uh, with patents, that that may present a problem for hyperledger uh, incubation. The second point uh, I think that's going to be important is um, do we have enough interest in this? You know, beyond just Babel, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, beyond just the the the, the original proposers. Um, uh, to, to make a go of this. In other words, are there others in the community that would be willing to jump in and help with the development and potentially also help with um, working on integration um, into the other um, uh, the other uh, platforms like Sawtooth and Burrow and Fabric and so forth. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, all the other sort of check marks that we have from an incubation perspective obviously have to apply, but those are going to be the key criteria, I think. Um, and I think also, you know, from a TSC perspective, the other existing members of the community need to decide, you know, do we, do we want to bring this one into the, you know, into the house, so to speak. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I tend to think that this is one of those things that people are going to need to sleep on a little bit. I think this was a useful discussion, a very useful and interesting discussion, but um, I suspect people want to go back and, and, and mull it over and sleep on it a little bit and, and get a sense for, um, you know, where this might go. Um, you know, I, I, I sense there's a little bit of interest potentially in the community in, 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 in doing something like this, but, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to, and I, and I think Brian agrees with this, that we wouldn't want to necessarily have peer review be some sort of a gating factor for whether we might incubate a project or not. Um, of course, if it turns out that there's a significant flaw in the in the algorithm um, in the protocol, then obviously, you know, we have to rethink you know, what we do with that project. But, um, uh, you know, that said, uh, I think somebody noted in the in, in, in the thread that, you know, well, Kafka hasn't been peer reviewed. So, um, you know, it's based on protocols that have been, but uh, it's not exact. So. Anyway, I'll, I'll just I'll just put it at that, and I'll suggest that um, you know we we try and wrap up the discussion here, and um, you know continue to discuss on the mailing list. But you know, Martin and company, if you can sort of help to sort of reinforce in the um, you know in the proposal. Um, oh my God, I hate this so so much sometimes. <laughs> here it is. Sorry. Um, not just, you know, the what, what's it about and how does it work and so forth, but also, you know, who else is expressing interest in, um, uh, in collaborating on this? I think that would strengthen the proposal. Um, yeah, you know, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so we, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna look at the the IP issue uh, most of all, uh, first of all, and then uh, try to to come back with some information about this. So this is Dave Hughesby. Um, I the one thing I saw in the thread that I liked was the idea that maybe this project would be the catalyst for creating a project that was like an abstract consensus machine for lack of a better word, you know, like we could bring this project in as an incubation and we could start moving the implementations of the other consensus algorithms over to it. 
and build a nicely encapsulated um, consensus mechanism, right? That has a really nice managed API that the other DLT um, projects could rely on, right? And make it configurable. So uh, it would be a pluggable component into the like burrow and fabric almost immediately. And then the other uh, DLT projects could abstract or to use this abstract consensus mechanism. I thought that was a really good idea and, and it would definitely broaden the appeal of um, the project, I think, and might make it, you know, raise, raise to the level that um, there'd be a lot more support from the community. Mm. Yeah, that makes I, sense. Uh, this is, yeah, this is Len Devin. I certainly agree with everything and uh, what you just said. Um, uh, the, the only my only concern is um, if we are going to recommend it as an interoperable component and module within Hyperledger, we have to do our due diligence to ensure that it adheres to the highest of standards of best practices um, to ensure robustness. Um, because then it becomes a common module uh, within a recommended uh, solution or framework that we'll be recommending to our clients at some point in time. So we need to ensure that we have reviewed uh, the functionality in terms of the standards that are um, uh, sort of been incorporated with it. We've been talking about the hash graph and others and whether it does so uh, robustly enough to become a component, uh, which would be a major component within Hyperledger. Um, so yes, I agree overall the approach is a good one. And the other concern I had is uh, for incubation, do we have a well-defined incubation process in terms of the criteria that must be adhered to and satisfied within the TSE to move any project forward um, to, into the approval stage. And part of that should be robustness in terms of the standards, the best practices being employed, and whether we can recommend that as a solution or as a co component to our peers and to our eventual clients. So these are just the concerns that are raised, and I'm sure we've addressed them before. But given our level of, of mature today and the interest that we have from a much wider field, we need to provide that due diligence. So uh, that's really all I wanted to say. So there is great uh, graduation criteria from incubation to full project status that we put into place. Um, things like having your CII badge, right? But that's more about the project itself. That's a meta kind of thing. Like, does the project itself have all the right place things in place, like web page and, and a mailing list and a bug tracker and all that kind of stuff? Um, but we could certainly uh, look at doing other things like security audits and things like that. I don't know. I think that's more yeah. incubation to active, right? And I think what Leonard is suggesting mm -hmm. is maybe we need criteria to become incubated. Well, you know, I think it's kind of like the definition of obscenity. We'll know it when we see it. Um, right? I, I, I don't know that you can write down a explicit set of criteria for incubating a project at Hyperledger. There are going to be different kinds of things you can't say that a requirement is that it be peer reviewed for something like cello because cello isn't something that you would peer review, right? Um, it's just a deployment framework. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the intention here is that we sort of know what we want and that we're, you know, going to be looking at the proposal as a whole for all the things that we're asking for in the proposal template. And then we make a decision collectively, independently and collectively, about whether or not we think it's a fit for the Hyperledger organization. And, you know, whether the project, you know, the TSC members that are in many cases maintainers or, you know, participants in some of the other projects want to have a sister project um, uh, join. And, Obviously, there's politics involved. Obviously, there's, you know, sort of, there's all kinds of things involved. So you can't really write that down. Um, and in fact, I think it would be, it would be incorrect to try and write it down because you get it wrong and then we'll be arguing about it incessantly. So I suggest that, you know, we have a pretty good template, you know, that, um, you know, we collectively created 
and the things that are in there are the things that we're all looking for, right? And that's why I was emphasizing, I think that, you know, to make a strong proposal, you want to be able to say, we're going to build something, we're very excited and passionate about it, we have other people that are excited and passionate about it, um, and, and that's going to be part of the important aspect of things. And then, you know, socializing the nature of the project and getting others to you know, and again, I think you're, you know, Martin and company, you're doing the right things. You're saying, hey, we think that it can integrate with this X, Y, and Z. So now the sort of the next step is to say, you know, is, is, to, is to get that buy-in from those other projects, that that's something that would be interesting. <clears throat> yeah, well, we've, we've talked to the teams, uh, Burrow and, um, and Fabric, and they suggested we do a pull request with um, so with plugins, basically wrappers around um, around a, yeah. a, a Babel proxy. So there is interest right. from I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, you know we're we're out of out of time for today, but like I said, this is it's certainly you know today's been a very interesting discussion. Um, you know, certainly much more thought provoking than any of the others we have. Um, and there are going to be differences of opinion, and that's okay, right? You know. Yeah, one, one last thing. Um, there was the comment from from Dan. Uh, would it be possible to prepare a demo for maybe next time that uh, uh, goes step th uh, step by step through uh, through basically one or two rounds of consensus achievement on Hashgraph? Yeah, 